Um, okay, just to introduce Jules. Uh, Jules is head of the uh, Innov sorry, head of innovation for GKN Land Systems, and he's uh, into the UK-based uh, manufacture of driveline components for the agricultural and off-highway industry. Um, in this role, he's responsible for the design and development of new products and systems focusing on hybrid and electric drive systems. Uh, Jules joined GKN in uh, 2011 as a global engineering director for wheels and structures with responsibility for product development across six worldwide sites. He joined from Tata Motors, where he was chief engineer at their European Technical Center. Prior to Tata, Jules had a number of senior chassis and vehicle engineering roles with uh, BMW and MG Rover Groups. Jules is a chartered uh, engineer and a fellow of the Institution of Mechanical Engineers and as a member of the IMECE Professional uh, Review Committee. Um, and I'd just like to welcome Jules and thank him very much for coming to do the presentation tonight. And I'd ask him to start. Okay. Thanks, Jules. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, um, as Paul just said, my name is Jules Carter. I uh, work at a company called GKN. I, uh, I don't know how well GKN is known over here, but I will explain a little more as we go on. Um, I'd just like to start by thanking Engineers Island and the IMECE for inviting me over. Um, it doesn't take uh, much of an invitation for get me to come over to Dublin, uh, a lovely city, and I'm really pleased to be here. So let me uh, find my clicker and crack on. So I'll start by just uh, setting the uh, introduction with uh, who GKN are. Um, I'm not going to bore you for long on this, so uh, it'll be a very, very quick history. GKN are a, a British company um, specialising in four different sectors, and primarily the biggest sector being driveline. GKN driveline have been in the uh, supplier to the car industry for many years famously supplying drive shafts and gearbox systems uh, to most of the world's car manufacturers. GKN Aerospace uh, supply the aviation industry with uh, various things from engine parts, wings, wing systems, um, even, even um, windows for aeroplanes. The um, Third area is powder metallurgy. They make sintered powders and make them into um, components for the automotive industry using um, sintering processes. Uh, and the fourth division is my division, land systems. We um, traditionally look after the, uh, the sale of, of systems like wheels, dry shafts, prop shafts, gearboxes into the ag off highway construction industry uh, machines supplying many of the world's OEMs. The company itself goes back to 1759. It's nice to be in Dublin because the only other famous company that started in 1759 is Guinness. Um, we did ask if they'd share a birthday party, but they weren't too bothered. The, um, the key thing about GKN is it sees themselves as a very strong engineering base um, and a global company as well, 48,000 employees all around the globe. So I'm now going to just focus on the eDrive technology that we've been developing. Uh, one of the areas that we are focusing across the whole of GKN is e-drive technology. Predominantly, driveline and land systems are looking at the use of electric motors and electric drive uh, in their, their areas. But it is some interest to GKN Aerospace as the, um, the aircraft world starts looking at electrification. And GKN Powered and Metallurgy are looking at how they can supply into the electric drive world as well. And driveline, they're already most of the electric and hybrid electric cars in the world uh, with gearbox systems to uh, connect electric motors to the uh, to the road wheels um, and then rather cleverly in hybrid systems where in examples such as the Peugeot the diesel engine and gearbox at the front in the traditional way the electric motor sits in the boot and runs the back wheels from a battery pack through the GKN driveline and this allows for a hybrid mode of either standard diesel engine or uh, a hybrid electric diesel or just an electric drive if need be. So what I was going to talk to you today about is the, um, the GKN hybrid power and the flywheel system they've developed. So first of all just to explain about GKN hybrid power. It's the newest bit of GKN and it did start life uh, within the Williams Formula One team. Back in 2007, the Formula One 
world started looking at kinetic energy recovery systems, CURS, as a new system for the, um, for the racing cars. And I will show you the, the flywheel system, and it was developed for that application and tested on the race, Formula One racing cars in 2008. Um, Williams themselves have been around since the uh, 1970s, uh, famously winning many world championships and constructors titles. Uh, and they saw potential in the flywheel and developed it for the Formula One. However, the way things work in motorsport, the system started um, using, having to use the battery systems rather than flywheels, so they couldn't use it. And they looked at the technology going into other branches of motorsport, which I'll show you in a little while. Um, and last year, Williams decided that the, there was such an exciting potential outside motorsport for the uh, flywheel systems that they looked to sell the company. Um, GKEN acquired it just a year ago um, on the 1st of April last year. Uh, and, but we'd been working with Williams on the uh, applications for a year or so before that. So uh, we knew fully well what, uh, what the technology was and what it could, was capable of. So the hybrid power team that um, started off back in 2007 as three guys and has grown rather rapidly to the point where we acquired the company. It was 50 strong, a bunch of mostly electrical, uh, electromechanical um, engineers, a lot of motorsport background, a lot of power electronics knowledge, um, a really uh, innovative bunch of guys solving a lot of problems to try and get the flywheel system to be both successful in motorsport but also successful uh, in the totally different world, as I'll show you in a second, of uh, the London buses. So um, um, two parallel streams and, believe it or not, two totally different ways of engineering product. So I talked about the motorsport. The flywheel did never race in Formula One, um, but it has found a, a very successful time racing in uh, touring cars. Um, the, I say the Formula One guys use battery systems. Uh, they actually abuse battery systems because the batteries are dead after two hours. And um, I did hear that they cost about £30,000 a piece, so it's only Formula One that can afford to throw £30,000 away after two hours. And certainly in the land of 24-hour um, of racing, you can't afford that. And uh, so the Kerr system is has found uh, great success, first of all with the Porsche and then with Audi. Audi have won Le Mans three times now with the, uh, with the uh, flywheel system board, and we're working with them on this year's car as well. So let me explain and, uh, about the uh, kinetic energy storage, the flywheel, or as well show you, it's actually a mechanical battery. Flywheels have been around for ages, um, nothing new in the flywheel. And uh, when we were pulling this together, we thought it'd be good to go back and do a bit of basic physics, just, uh, just to show that I've been doing a bit of homework. Um, you'll see here, and I'm sure everybody in the room at some point sat in college doing flywheel theory, um, but it is important to explain why we do what we do. So the flywheel in spinning any rotating object spins and stores energy because the energy in a spinning object uh, is proportional to the inertia of the object and the uh, rotational speed squared. So when you design a flywheel, inertia, which is rotating mass, is good, but speed is much better because it's a squared relationship. So the key to success on a flywheel is if you can get very good speed. Um, the other key to success on a flywheel is to get your mass as far away from the, uh, on the radius as possible um, because there's, again, there's a, the inertia has a square ratio to the, to the, um, for the uh, mass. So the further mass out, the ratio um, is squared by the radius. So that's good to get your mass as far out for it as possible and spin it as quickly as possible. So that's perfect. Uh, the only slight problem with that is the stress within a thin wall cylinder. Um, the faster you spin an object, the higher the stress in the outside surface is, the more it wants to explode. Um, and so the stress proportional to the radius squared and the speed squared. So the fact we want to go very fast and at a big radius is not very good for stress. And um, that's therefore key when it comes to um, 
choosing what material to make a flywheel out of. If we go back to that, good old probably cast iron there, and uh, as you can probably tell, that was never meant to spin very quickly. But in our application, we want to spin things quickly for the good reason we want to get the weight down. We don't want to carry that around on every racing car. So I've done a little bit of a chart here, um, that bore you with a few numbers, but it does prove my point. Um, and I've tried to compare composites. We make our uh, flywheel out of um, high-grade carbon fiber, so a carbon fiber composite, and just compare it to what it would be like if you had a steel, because that's normal for car flywheels, etc. Um, but also to show the the, um, the differences that weight makes, um, I've picked the light aluminium and the heavy tungsten. So I can show there that we've got the um, the density of those th four materials. Um, and for the purpose of this totally fictitious experiment, I've kept the uh, the radius is the same. And um, so we've done a flywheel with an inner and an outer radius. And then I've um, tried to show, I think the key thing to look at is what speed you can achieve in the flywheel to um, to keep the stress, the hoop stress, within acceptable limits. In the maximum allowable stress and the hoop stress. Now the key thing is, um, or the thing we, we look at is, we are using carbon fiber composite, but we have to have a very good safety factor. Um, because of the application, it's either in racing cars or it's uh, on buses and things, uh, we have to be absolutely sure we're not going to run to any problems. So we have a very high safety factor. Probably if you're doing a flywheel in steel, you wouldn't need, or uh, um, aluminium or tungsten for that matter, you wouldn't need such a high safety factor. And I've factored that in. And so your speed becomes proportional to your stress at, the, at that. And so the, oh, so the stress level um, is what, actually main, makes the speed. So to keep within our safety factor of two and our allowable stress, we can spin this flywheel 36,000 RPM. Uh, if you did it in steel or, well, actually surprisingly for the difference in density, um, the metal, all the metals spin at about the same speed to achieve their uh, maximum stresses. Um, I then tried to see what it would be like to get the energy storage you need so with energy being um, proportional to the speed squared, our lightweight flywheel can store a lot of energy. Um, and just to make sure I didn't exceed the stress, I kept the radius as the same, but I increased the height. So if I was to have, instead of my flywheel, um, a steel flywheel to do the same energy storage at the same diameter and only spinning at the speed that the stress let me spin to, it would have to be half a meter high. And it would have to weigh 184 kilos. And when you're dealing with racing cars, that's about, um, well, with the racing cars or buses, that's about three people uh, the, to worth of weight. So it's absolutely impossible for us to do the same kind of pro um, project, the same kind of product, rather, with a steel or, in fact, any metal flywheel. The carbon fiber allows us to spin very quickly, takes the stresses, and keeps the weight down. Right, that's the end of the lecture bit. The rest is just some nice pictures. Um, the other key part to our, the success of our flywheel is to use um, what I like to call the electric gearbox. So we've had the mechanical battery, uh, and batteries are normally electrical, so gearbox is normally mechanical, so we have an electrical gearbox. The, um, the key thing for us is the, the control of um, the electric motors um, and the storage of energy uh, allows us to the the electric drive allows us to generate um, and you'll see why in a second the um, generate the speeds we require to run the flywheel 36,000 rpm at a peak but we're dealing with something here where we're using a flywheel to stop save energy when we're stopping a vehicle so nominally our vehicle has to be stopped so the drive motor has to be going zero at the time the flywheel motor is going full speed and then once the flywheel motor gives up its energy and puts it back into the drive motor and the vehicle accelerates then the drive motor is going full speed when the um, flywheel is going at its slow speed so we have to control through power electronics two power inverters um, and connected by a DC link the, um, the, the 
from the drive motor and generator through to the flywheel motor. So each motor ends up being either a motor or generator. And I will explain more about that in a minute. So just a bit about the flywheel itself. Um, our flywheel is made out of uh, carbon fibre, filament wound. So it's wound like, like cotton on a bobbin. I have, for those of you in the room, and I'm sorry to the people uh, on the podcast, I, I can't really show you this, but I bought a little section of our flywheel. Anybody can come and have a look at it later. Um, you can see it's very simply a block of carbon fibre, and this bit I'm showing you is just a slither through the, uh, through the flywheel, the black section on that flywheel. So that's carbon fibre wound in a resin and then um, effectively baked. And um, the, I've put it up there, so I can't even ask the question. So there are 80 million strands of carbon fibre just in that little section alone. Um, but when you're going at 36,000 RPM, this is the bit that blows my mind and I know about it, um, that's got a surface speed of Mach 1.8. And the, uh, one of our engineers was trying to explain it to me. If you stuck a, uh, a one um, kind of smallest coin, so a one cent piece on there, by the time you're spinning at 36,000 RPM, it's about the same weight pulling off as a Ford Mondeo. That's the kind of the, um, the amount of forces that this is seeing. Consequently, one of the biggest issues we have in making this flywheel is getting the balance of the right. We have to balance it within about, um, I think it's about 10 mic 10. Yeah, it's something like 10 microns. It's minute balance. Um, the inner section is called MLC, magnetic layered composite. It's actually a glass fiber, still wound in the same way. Um, but inside that glass fiber, um, and you can probably see it sparkling away in the light, are millions and millions of bits of magnetic powder. So it's effectively uh, that, I'm, I'm reliably assured, assured, is not. Uh, magnetized yet, but it's um, a ba basically a magnet. If that was magnetized, I could probably pull all your uh, coins out of your pocket from here. Um, so that is then magnetized into strips to act as the, <coughs> the magnet. So the rotor has the magnet of the motor in it, and the around that to keep it all together is this very very piece of carbon fibre. So that becomes our um, oh, I'm picking the wrong bit, our flywheel, and through a Again, a carbon fibre end cap, it mounts to a central shaft, which is then um, put inside uh, composite bearings. The benefits of our system, then, is that um, I've talked about the weight, the importance of keeping the weight down, but it means that you have very, very high power density. Um, it's mechanical, um, and this is really comparing it to a normal battery, so I'm talking about it being the mechanical battery. Normally, with uh, um, normal batteries, they do not like cold temperatures. They don't like hot temperatures. They've got to be kept in a quite a narrow temperature brand. Um, this really doesn't care what the temperature is because it's mechanical. Um, and because it's mechanical, it'll start and stop all day. It doesn't actually have any, uh, any loss of performance with life. I'll just show you the section through. Um, I've talked about the rotor. The rotor you can see here is the, is the gray section um, and the MLC, this magnetic bit, is, the, is colored in pink here. So that's the rotator, rotor spinning. It spins in a perfect vacuum, and I mean perfect vacuum. Uh, when it's running, because any air in here would create friction and losses, we run it in a vacuum that has got the air down here down to a few molecules only. Um, the middle section, which is... Um, the stator, so it's wound coils of the motor, obviously being the stator, it's not spinning. So it's, if you like, it's an inside out normal motor um, to keep the radius high for the rotating part. The stator stays in the middle and you can see the green section in the middle is the rotor, is the center shaft through the two bearings. Um, it is as simple as that. And I should compare just again to prove the point about why we do it as a as a mechanical battery is it's actually in vehicles where we're comparing it to um, to drive um, electric systems when you're stopping and starting a vehicle so you're capturing the energy of braking which are very high power loads uh, from the motor as a vehicle slows down you're keeping it for a relatively short period of time before it accelerates again so the flywheel 
can, ac can take, because of the very high power density, so it's, its great ability to absorb power, can take huge amounts of power. If you want a battery to do the same, you need an awful lot of batteries. Each cell will only do a certain amount of work. Um, and the other competitor we come across is capacitors, and it's the same for capacitors. If you want more power, you have to have more capacitors. So when you start looking at our system and say, well, we can have 120 kilowatts, um, and our system weighs 55 kilograms all in, then a battery pack to do the same 120 kilowatts will weigh about 240 kilos, and for a, a supercaps, it's actually even heavier. The other problems batteries have is they're not good at life. They're a chemical reaction, and every time they um, change state, so they stop charging and start giving out power, or stop giving out power and start charging again, they count that as a cycle. And batteries tend to have poor cycle life in the, in the order of thousands of cycles. Um, we actually have had a battery on test, a flywheel on test, um, and we're very confident with the long-term durability that we can see well over millions of cycles. There's actually no reason that it were to see the end of life of a flywheel um, other than bearing wear out and the bearings are serviceable anyhow. So we expect to see five or six years between services. And um, this just goes on to show you that the... Um, there are other flywheels out there. We're not the only people um, barking up the flywheel tree. And uh, also out of Formula One came a mechanical flywheel system. Um, this, oh, sorry, wrong button again. This mechanical flywheel uh, is driven directly from the gearbox through a, um, an infinitely variable gearbox. So this gearbox can effectively take any ratio and therefore as the vehicle wants to slow down, the ratios increase to, to drive the flywheel harder, and as the flywheel, uh, as the vehicle wants to accelerate, the gearbox changes ratio to slow the, gear, the flywheel down and support driving the vehicle. So it works just like our electrical gearbox. Um, the, um, the main difference being this actually has to be connected directly into the drive of the vehicle, whereas our gearbox, being electrical, is on the end of a wire. We can put the flywheel wherever we like. I'll show you in a minute. Um, the other system that compares to it is, is one that uh, a company called Ricardo are doing, which has a magnetic drive. And this is still in the test. But to get the drive through the f into the flywheel, the flywheel in each case is in a vacuum. That has to be the case. The flywheel in each case is, is a composite. Um, but to get through the vacuum, so we're using an electric motor where there is nothing but... What, um, flux going through the, the uh, vacuum wall. The, um, the, uh, the flybridge system uses a shaft through a very clever vacuum seal, but in a way that also generates some losses, um, as does the uh, mechanical gearbox. The, um, the Ricardo system uses magnets as a drive gearbox to get through the, fl the, the, um, the fly, uh, get through the, to the vacuum. And uh, again, that has some problems with uh, with inefficiencies due to the uh, due to the, the magnetic drive. Um, I just explained for a moment that we also in GCAM make a, a very special electric motor called uh, the Evo electric motor. And I won't spend too long on this, but um, most motors you come across are called things called radial flux motors. This is a special motor called an axial flux motor, um, and we use this in a lot of our applications. The benefit of an axial flux motor, so the rotor in this um, is a flat dinner plate of a rotor, and uh, that gives a very, very short length gear, um, motor, which is brilliant for packaging in vehicles. Um, and just to explain a bit about that, the normal motor has, a, has a coils along the outside of the magnets that are on the, the uh, rotating part of the motor, our flywheel does it the other way around, but in a traditional motor, that's the case. So uh, motors tend to be long, and um, actually in the middle of a motor there's, there's nothingness because there's an empty space because they want the radius to give you torque. With our uh, um, axial flux, the rotor itself, the magnets, are in, as I say, a dinner plate formation, um, and the flux goes across there 
to uh, between the stators um, and drives the motor. It means that we get a very big torque uh, in a very short motor, so um, um, ideal for a lot of uh, driven applications. Um, I, I put this in really, I mean, most people have seen electric motor efficiency charts um, and the, e the Evo motor is is a very good efficient motor producing very high levels of efficiency from quite low speeds. So uh, we, we can make most use of that when we're driving things like the bus. The, um, with all these hybrid systems, efficiency is what you're chasing. And where we're competing with the mechanical gearbox, because we have a, a, a motor at one end and the flywheel at the other, we have two electric machines. So having two electric machines that are as efficient as possible is key because the, the uh, power, the energy is going from mechanical energy through to electrical, through the power, power electric. They all have to be efficient and back through the motor, so back into the flywheel to mechanical. So we don't want to waste any power. Um, any mechanical gearbox wastes power. It has inefficiencies. And we actually are finding that our electric drive is as efficient, if not more efficient, than a mechanical gearbox. Um, so just to show the benefits of the Evo motor, I've shown a couple of the applications. So in a, an application where the motor is within the hub of a machine, you'll see the short length of the motor really helps it fit within the wheel of the machine. Uh, we have another application where it's uh, on the drive axle of a truck. Um, and these motors are actually <coughs> look a lot bigger because they're actually two motors back to back. And each of those motors is two motors in parallel. So there's four electric motors across the back axle of a truck. So, um, and that has the uh, torque and power to drive a 20 ton truck, no problem. So I've been talking about buses and trucks. I shall explain. First of all, I'll show you what a bus looks like. <laughs> I don't think I needed that, but that's a very London bus. Um, and the best drives on the bus cycles. And we love buses. I didn't know I loved buses before I started this job, but I'm beginning to find I do. Um, mainly because the bus drive cycle is ideal for, for uh, hybrid systems. The, um, the machine that goes constantly um, without uh, interruption is not going to be helped by a regenerative hybrid system. Our system has to save energy and um, as you slow down and use it to accelerate. So anything stopping and starting and there's nothing that stops and starts more than the bus in London um, as, it, uh, as it crawls around. So it's constantly accelerating or braking and stopping many, many hundreds of times a day, which is ideal for us. And when we look at what's going on on the bus, uh, measuring the speed and the loads of the, uh, of the engine, um, we can see that a lot of the losses in the, uh, in the bus are due to the kinetic losses. So these are the braking losses, the yellow section of the graph as we add up the losses and the inefficiency each time. Um, you can see a lot of, of the uh, actual energy that's lost driving the bus is due to the braking of the bus. So um, a rather nice chart, a colleague of mine drew up for me to explain all this and hopefully I can do it, do it justice. Um, a bus has a diesel engine, or indeed a truck as well, uh, and um, when we burn diesel we tend to get about 30% of that energy to move the vehicle. The rest goes out as, uh, as heat um, and losses within the engine, friction losses, etc. within the engine. Um, so out of the 100% of energy within the diesel, we're getting about 30% of it to move the vehicle. And, um, it's one of the big problems with any diesel machine. It's not very efficient to start with. But given that we're moving the vehicle, that's, let's say that's 100% of the energy to move the bus, then we, uh, we lose some of that energy when it comes to transmission losses. We lose some of it in drag. Now, buses are big square things, but they don't go very fast, so the drag is actually surprisingly low. Um, some of it's rolling resistance, tyres, etc. So the key, the key thing is that then that uh, large amount of losses that are kinetic losses, so braking losses, um, we then try and capture. Um, so our machine has some inefficiencies and some of the uh, energy we can't capture, particularly when you're going very slowly. The last few uh, uh, miles an hour we, we uh, can't capture. 
So um, all in all, we aim to re recover about 28% of the energy. So um, if, if it's a good day and we're stopping and starting well enough, we should be able to uh, recover that much energy. Um, so when we look at why we are doing hybrid systems on buses um, and where we came from doing hybrid systems for, for racing cars, the, the key thing for us is that there have been hybrid systems on buses for a long time and they use the batteries we've been talking about, um, they use capacitors, um, but the, the, the key thing is we were, we were very, or we realised our system with the cost of the system really should enable a, um, an affordable payback. So operators, and it's the guys who run the buses that want to buy these systems, they're paying the fuel bill after all. Um, and they'll buy our system if they can see a sensible return. So when they're buying a bus to run for, say, 10 years, they were asking for a s hybrid systems that could be paid back in about three years. So the cost of the system to them, if it saves that in three years of fuel, then they, uh, we have c happy customers. Um, and we were looking at two different systems, one of which is a retrofit system, which is where you have a bus already built, um, and we're also developing what we call an OE fit, original equipment fit, so it would go on the bus as it's built. Now that's slightly, uh, um, a slightly cheaper system if you don't have to retrofit the bus system, so uh, hence the two different numbers. But both ours fit in the, um, in the payback window that we talked about. Um, there are other systems that do, mild hybrids and some of the new um, um, constant variable uh, transmission systems but they don't show the same kind of fuel saving so we can see 25 percent fuel saving um, and the only other systems doing that the parallel hybrids and series hybrid electric systems you'll see have much worse payback periods so um, for us the key thing is um, to be in the affordable window uh, interestingly in this in this chart um, this report that i got this from battery electric you'll say well that's got a um, a payback period, a very bad payback period, naturally doesn't save that much fuel. Well, surely it saves all the fuel. This is because it's uh, well to wheel fuel saving. This is from gr digging the, uh, bringing the oil out of the ground or whatever you burn for electricity. So it, it, it allows for the full electrical um, CO2 losses. Okay, having a look at how our flywheel fits into the bus system. I'm talking buses here, but there is actually no difference in whether you do this on buses or delivery trucks or whatever. We, we have to get to the, um, the vehicle and fit the drive motor and a small gearbox into the prop shaft of the vehicle. So the vehicle keeps its same engine as the dry, dr diagram at the bottom shows. The uh, little pink rectangle is the motor that drives in and breaks into the uh, prop shaft. Literally, we take one prop shaft off and we fit two prop shafts with the motor and the gearbox, and that's the mechanical drive uh, taken care of. The power electronics box and the flywheel <coughs> box are literally that shape because they just sit under the seat of a bus. So um, deliberately so we can fit the system easily, these boxes are designed to fit in the space underneath the seat. Um, and they actually can sit fairly far forward in the bus. The benefit of having just needing to fit cables rather than mechanical drives is that we have no problem where you install a flywheel within reason. You could put it on the roof um, if that's what you wanted, although not a good idea on London double-decker buses because they don't have any headroom to the bridges. But um, a lot of double-decker buses tend to fit systems in the roof, so uh, it's certainly possible. Um, anything else on this? Oh yeah, so. As I say, that is then showing you a saving of 25% of fuel dependent on the route on the uh, on the route you're going. If your route is, you know, a motorway route between the airport and the city, you're not going to see that level of saving. So our market and our payback. Um, I talked about the three-year payback, and that's key to us and. If you, if you look at it another way, the, the amount of fuel you can save, um, I put up the side. The other key thing is how far a vehicle goes in the, in the year. And um, clearly, if you're going to do an awful lot of mileage and save a lot of fuel, it's going to be very easy for me to save, sell you a system. Um, so at the 
top right of this graph, I've got lots and lots of money coming in from, from fuel save, so I can afford a nice expensive system. But, unfortunately, buses don't tend to do very big mileages. They're out a long time, but they're not going very quickly. But they do get fuel, big fuel savings. Trucks that do do the high mileage aren't doing the stopping and starting, so they don't get as good a fuel saving. But, because they're say, even at a 5% fuel save you may see on a, a truck, you're still saving fuel and um, they're using an awful lot of fuel. There is still a market where we can, uh, where you can see systems that will, uh, that will find, um, find um, affordable fuel savings. So I tried to show this in the green section, good, red section, bad, so that's fairly traditional. But it leaves a band in the middle where we can see, um, where we can see opportunities. And at the moment, um, we see an awful lot of buses fitting into our marketplace but not many trucks, and there's not many trucks which are going to take this technology yet. Um, I put refuse trucks on there because clearly you start thinking about trucks that have stopped starting, and we all follow the bin lorry and get uh, frustrated when it uh, crawls down the street stopping all the time, so obviously there's an there's a opportunity there. Um, and not every truck does the same thing, so light trucks could either be on the, uh, going down the motorways, but they could also be in the city supplying us supermarkets or... Um, even quite heavy trucks drive around in cities supplying fuel to petrol stations, etc. So um, there are opportunities throughout the, uh, throughout the whole of the market for us. Um, however, things are moving on. And the next thing I want to talk about is series hybrid systems. So with a parallel hybrid, this is what the bus and the, um, is, where the motor helps the diesel engine. In parallel to the diesel engine, the motor will help drive the bus. We do not make any change to the diesel engine or the gearbox of the bus, so that's, um, that's all standard. Uh, and as I've said, we, uh, we're looking for a market which would pay for the gyro drive system with about a three-year fuel saving payback. But if you start looking at a series hybrid bus, so the motor is doing, the electric motor is doing all the driving um, and not the... Uh, the diesel isn't doing anything other than providing the electricity to drive the bus, then the, the engine, the diesel engine, actually becomes a generator for the electric drive system. And you can see here, with the two, I've tried to show the, uh, the pink motors driving the, the, the wheels on their own. Um, whilst you're dealing with an awful lot more power in the system, you still need to be able to catch the regen braking and manage the power of the... Uh, of the system and the flywheel has a use in these uh, in these types of systems and this fuel saving potential is enormous so when we can save um, I, I've cut it down just to just the maths begin to look really um, far too impressive but I said if you can save 20% with regenerative braking on a typical machine um, actually by cutting your engine size and therefore having a more um, efficient engine, just optimised to run only at the speed of the generator, then the potential fuel saving there alone is at 28%. So a total saving that we'll see on series hybrids has a potential of being much higher, 43 or more percent fuel saving. Uh, and if somebody's bit arithmetic on why 28 plus 20 doesn't add up, I'll leave you to work out why that's right and God's wrong. <laughs> because you're only saving 20% of the 28%. I'll, I'll leave you to work that one out. I, I'm assured I'm right. So, what does all that do for us? Um, the benefit is that the, um, those technologies are going to move a lot more vehicles into the payback window for our system. Sorry, I should just go back and explain. The other benefit I like about series hybrids, and I would say this, is that this no longer has a gearbox. We don't make gearboxes, so that's good. And it has a much smaller engine. Well, we don't make engines either, so cutting the money out of the engine is good as well. So as a system overall, it's going to cost less than the system in the top. The, the, the series hybrid machine will cost less to build than the parallel hybrid. So when we have this out, it will cost less and save more. So uh, logically, it's going to um, deliver a much better payback. So, um, and I've explained much bigger market. And the weird one, and I say weird because uh, 
is that actually there's a use for flywheels on electric buses as well. So here we have a bus that is entirely electric, has a battery, has motors, it doesn't need a flywheel. But if you think what I said about batteries, they do not like rapid changes in power. They like to deliver their power nice and slowly. So if you have a machine that needs to accelerate and brake and accelerate and brake, then the flywheel, because it loves that idea of giving power out constantly, um, accelerating, decelerating, uh, speeding up, slowing down all day long, no problem, it can do that whilst the battery is just supplying the constant speed of power for the bus, for the average use of the bus. And if you're going to do that and cut out all the attempts at regening into the battery, at changing the state of the battery, um, only charging it once a day, then you can not only get a lot bigger range out of your battery, you can also start using um, some much more stable battery chemistries that will allow you to have much cheaper batteries. They will not lead as much cooling or managing, so they'll be actually smaller batteries, or another way of putting it, you can put more batteries in the space that you put uh, currently. Um, most battery boxes are a fair proportion cooling fluid and other such. Uh, so you can get a cheaper battery, better um, power density, so more power in the given weight, and it'll live longer. So now you can start seeing that with the use of the flywheel, battery buses um, will, uh, will have batteries that will live longer. So people who are currently wishing to buy battery buses uh, and going, well, I'm not sure how long my battery's going to last. I don't know how I'm going to afford a new battery pack. And it's the same for any battery vehicle, but really. Um, the flywheel will actually help in that situation. And what we're looking at is a flywheel system being able to make a battery system live for the whole 10 years of a bus life. <coughs> trucks, I'm not going to go into the detail, but it's, it's the same story in trucks. The uh, ability for series hybrids to cut down the engine size and save fuel. Um, so I've kind of explained why it's the bee's knees for buses and trucks. Um, but there are other applications to the flywheel. It really, uh, one of the good things about being involved in this flywheel is um, the number of things that come out of the woodwork. Once people start getting their head around this ability to store very high amounts of electrical power quickly, they keep thinking of new applications. Um, so I'm going to go through a few of those as well. So I've talked about buses and trucks, and the key thing about the bus and truck, as I said, is that start-stop energy regeneration. Um, wasting wasting fuel as you're stopping. Um, I should have put it on a slide, really, but just to give you an example. Our flywheel, I said earlier, stores about 1.4 megajoules of energy, which doesn't mean a lot. I mean, you wouldn't notice if it fell on the floor. That's about the same amount of energy as... Um, well, I worked it out once. It's about the same amount of energy you get in a double scotch. So every time you drink a double scotch, which I'm sure somebody in this room does, um, that's about 1.4 megajoules of energy, which isn't surprising really, because scotch is actually about the same calorific value as diesel. But, um, and therefore, every time you're stopping and starting the flywheel, you're effectively saving a double of fuel, which is great, and you think that's not very much. But when you do it all day long, 700 or 800 times a day, then it adds up to litres and litres by the end of the day. So we know exactly why that start-stop saves fuel. It's every time we fill up the energy store and let it down again, that's a, that amount of diesel not having to be burned. So that's a really good kind of driver for that uh, bus and truck market. Um, it's not just about that, though. We're moving into off-highway, and I'll show you an example of off-highway. So off-highway for us means agricultural construction machines, and I'll show you why in a minute. Um, and for them, it's the balancing of power uh, and the ability to use the power very quickly that will save a lot of, uh, a lot of fuel. Um, I'll talk about mass transit as well, trains, trams, etc. where just being able to store the energy on board easily can be a big uh, benefit to them. So a train doesn't do an awful lot of stopping and starting, um, but uh, certainly city trams do. So the ability to do that on board is actually carrying the energy around with them that's the big thing for them. Marine and industrial, which are more or less the same thing, and big marine um, is effectively a great big floating factory. 
it's actually about being able to store the energy near where you need it. If you've got a flywheel and, um, which is capable of storing up energy, when you want to use a huge amount of energy very quickly, you can use it out the flywheel. Uh, for example, in industrial, and I've shown a picture of a, 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 um, a welder, well, um, a spot welder on a car body there. Somebody needs to clean the tips if it's making that many sparks. Um, but where we do welding uh, for our wheels we make, we use a thing called a butt welder. That uses energy for about 13 seconds in every three-minute cycle. Now, when we put one of those in, we have to put the copper all the way back to the substation to put a welder in. And that can cost hundreds of thousands of pounds because that copper, the wire, has to be able to give all the energy needed for the 13 seconds the welder's running. So the other two and three quarter minutes, that's doing nothing. It's a total waste of money. Um, so we're looking at industrial applications for the flywheel where the flywheel will just charge up nice and slowly for three minutes and then give all its power in 13 seconds. That way the saving in the amount of wire back to the substation is minimised. These will plug into the standard factory electrical outlets. Um, it's just the same on ships. We're dealing with companies in big marine um, where they have systems for driving winches, systems for steering boats, uh, the um, rudder systems, and other such things that when they use, they're very high power, and therefore they need copper all the way back to the generator on the ship. And the ships are absolutely being um, full of these high power cables running around the ship but not doing things for most of the time so again they're looking at these systems as being a way of being able just to store energy local to where you need it so all comes all comes about as the cost effective storage of power I'll go on to the off highway um, opportunity to show a few diggers and um, the first thing about off-highway is that it's not like buses. There's no one application, one machine that's, um, that does everything. The machines are very much uh, developed for a specific need. And some of these machines are excellent for what we want, which, if you remember, is stuff that's stopping and starting, stuff that's using energy, um, particularly if it's you know, having to use energy to slow down and speed up. So loader shovels. Um, the loader shovels have about a 20-second drive cycle. They drive into a pile of gravel, they reverse out, they lift the gravel up and they tip it into a truck and they do that constantly all day long um, an ideal application, load alls lifting, scooting forward and backwards, uh, running around building sites, lifting um, you know, they're acting as forklifts, they're acting as cranes um, they're doing all, all those jobs, they're very common in agriculture for scooting around farmyards um, crawler shovels uh, excavators, again, um, they tend to be stationary, which is no, you'd think is no good for regen braking. But what they are doing all day is slewing. So they're turning and turning and turning and turning. And they put as much energy into stopping the slew as they do into starting it. So all those applications, big green ticks, are applications where we can see flywheels having a benefit. Um, constant power applications not for us. So a bulldozer runs, needs a bloody great diesel engine because it's pushing and pushing and pushing uh, and it can do that for great periods of time. So there's nothing really to be gained. Likewise, um, tractors, agricultural equipment where you're maybe in a field ploughing all day long at full throttle. So you need your engine for power for great percentages of the time. And that brings me on to the charts at the bottom because currently if I pick the wheel loader shovel uh, the engine is in everything. Uh, this applies to your car as much as it does for these. Engines are sized for peak performance. So you have an engine for the wheel loader shovel just to be able to do the peak reverses or lifts or whatever. Um, and that's, that's when you need everything going. Um, so you're, you're putting power into the ancillary losses, into mechanical losses. You've actually got the power to lift and move and shift or whatever you're doing um, but also you're losing that braking energy so when you're slowing down that's either go that's just going as heat now what we can do with the system we talked about the parallel drive um, sorry the series electric drive if you have the ability to use the flywheel to store power and then temporarily and then use it for the peaks 
you only need the engine producing the average power, which is why this red line is across the, uh, the middle of the chart. Um, because not only are you able to use the flywheel power to drive peaks, you're also use, using the flywheel power to save the braking energy as well. So overall, you can do a lot to save um, all the energy through, through the uh, drive cycle. Now that has some benefits, and this is, the, again, uh, the interesting side of this. A lot of these guys selling these machines now are selling them to contractors who are so having to sign up to work on quiet sites in city centres, environmentally sensitive sites. So they are absolutely driving the market to start producing machines that are using less fuel, good tick in the box. But because it's a smaller engine, it's going constant speed, oh, and it's not connected to the drive line, so it's not accelerating, decelerating all the time. It's just sitting there whirring away. It can do it in a much quieter box, um, and so they're much quieter to operate. They're using less fuel. And the other thing is, it's got a forward go, you know, it has a forward lever and a backward lever, and that's about it. They are actually much easier to train somebody how to operate. So your computer control can stop operator error um, and all sorts of things. So it starts becoming a really tenable, um, oh, this is the same sums as last time, almost. So the application with a loader shovel is we can replace a very large, uh, kind of typically an 8 litre diesel engine, um, with a generator that's probably about 3 litres. And that in itself shows you where the fuel saving is going to come from. Um, and it'll still have the ability, so I've, I've worked it all out for our, for our Evo drive motors, to, uh, to produce the same power overall and the same torque overall, or better torque overall, um, when, you, when you're using the, the system. Um, and all that from a, so we've got a hundred, effectively 180 kilowatt machine, but with a 72 kilowatt engine in it. That was a win. And um, you can see here from the, the, um, the little line drawing at the bottom, the engine is no longer connected at all to the drive line of the vehicle. Um, and actually going through this with one of our customers, the engineer was delighted because they can then start using the engine as a counterweight. They put it where they like to do what they want. So the engine will actually, I've drawn it nicely tucked up at the back here, that's just my uh, artistic skills, but they can actually hang it out in the counterweight. Um, so the weight of the engine can do something useful. Um, a view of the inside there showing the engine not doing that, because when we first started doing this work, we didn't realise that that's what the customers would want. Um, but we did show the, the flywheel nestling in the back of the machine um, with the full electric drives as well. Having spent years working in cars, it's quite nice to work on machines where you have no packaging issues, where you put everything. It's relatively straightforward, <laughs> plenty of space. OK, moving on. Uh, I, I've talked about the, um, the Audi Motorsport benefits. I've talked about the, uh, the work we're doing on some of the um, marine applications. And I'm now going to just talk a bit about trams. Um, and we've got a demonstrator contract underway with one of the underway with one of the tram manufacturers. Um, and again, this is about storing the system on uh, storing energy on the uh, on the tram itself. Um, and why do we want to do that? And that's because the uh, the key expense putting a tram system in is the cost of putting what's called the catenary up the wire, the overhead wires. So what they're looking at is developing a tram that does not need an overhead wire system. And so it will charge up as my, I'm quite proud of these graphics, um, my little tram trundles along. Uh, every time it gets to a, a, a um, tram stop, it can then pull in energy, electric, electrical energy, just at the time it stops. So you've only got the time it takes to, uh, for people to get on and off your tram to recharge your tram ready for the next journey. Um, and therefore flywheels, because their ability to pull electricity very quickly and store it, are ideal for, for those applications. So it can either be, as I've drawn it, with just a refuel every, um, every stop, or it can be that some, ro some of your city roads would have um, overhead wires where it's cheap to do, but other junctions and things like that could do without, where it's very expensive to put the system, the uh, overhead wires in. Um, and the trams can look after themselves. So that's a project on the way. 
but it doesn't stop there with trains. Um, again, the opportunity for uh, regen braking on diesels and electrics, going back to what I said about looking after um, uh, batteries, you think, well, what's that going to do with electric train? It's got its overhead cables. There's actually power problems if you start pushing electricity back into the, gr the overhead grids with some of the power systems. Now, I'm not the best electrical engineer to explain why. I think it's the third rail systems particularly that can't cope with it. So the flywheel will even allow <coughs> electric trains to regen brake, but they can't currently do. It drives me mad if you go into uh, the London Underground, uh, um, where they they use the um, they can't regen all the electricity properly, and they actually end up burning it off in the tunnel in resistor banks, which means that the underground, which is unbearably hot anyhow, gets even hotter. Um, and they're counteracting this by putting air conditioning on the underground trains, which is adding more heat in to the underground. So. Um, Somebody did tell me that London is actually several degrees hotter than it should be because of the underground system, but it's just ridiculous, and you know, proper management of energy would, uh, would sort all that out. Um, there's other areas which, um, another classic drawing, but to, to prove a point, um, with the uh, electrification of mainline routes, there are areas on mainline routes, um, particularly in the UK where the Victorians built the tunnels, uh, and didn't allow for it, where it is phenomenally expensive to put electrification through tunnels. So there is actually work going on to see whether trains can power themselves through a tunnel and then pick up the electricity again the other side. So um, again, flywheels could be a solution there. Um, I've done the sums, you'd need an awful lot of them, which I think is a brilliant idea if you're selling flywheels. Um, but it, it proves the point, you do need this ability to, uh, to store energy temporarily. I think that's it from me. Pause at that point. <laughs> On to questions. Yep. Um, just to, if there's any questions, just to, if you hang on till I get a microphone to use, that's all. Okay. I hope there's a question. Yeah. Oh, well, not him. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Rod McClellan, RMEV Limited. Jules, um, a very good talk, very well presented, thank you very much. Uh, it's interesting that since the inception of the flywheel system you're talking of at Williams, um, GKN have scaled up and scaled up and scaled up the system, uh, judging from your talk. Would there be any opportunity, as well as uh, looking at going up to from buses, trucks, light rail, heavy rail, uh, naval, etc. Be any opportunity to scale down the system, and perhaps look at uh, lightweight applications where braking is repeated. For example, uh, a city taxi or something of that nature. Uh, yes, we we currently make two sizes of machine. The machine that goes in the racing car is actually smaller than the machine that goes on the bus. The machine that goes on the bus actually came from the Formula One car size. The, the racing car is a slightly smaller one. Um, and actually, you know, we're looking at these applications, and part of the debate for us is, do we scale up and make a bigger one to make them, or is it more cost-effective to use two smaller ones? So do you want two mass-produced smaller ones, bus size ones, or do we want to do a bigger one? So we haven't actually got to the point yet where we decided whether we're playing the scale game by multiple units or by um, bigger bigger flywheels. I mean, the bigger flywheel, I showed a bit of the maths earlier, is a very complex um, um, you know, engineering problem, but could be worth it if, the, if there's enough volume there. But actually, I think a lot of these systems would go for multiple units of something that is in such mass production, it's more affordable, and it's easier to package four of a system than maybe one bigger system. So... Um, certainly, I envisage in trams and trains multiple units packaged in the in the vehicle. Can we go smaller? Yes. Um, again, you know, the, I think there's a great market there in hybrid vehicles, in electric vehicles, where a smaller system can do it. So, you know, again, that would have to be a small unit. We're still we're still thinking about the uh, the equation. Thank you. Uh, John, John Lancaster, retired. Um, I'm, it's fascinating. Uh, thanks very much. Good lecture. 
but the, the rundown of the flywheel itself, uh, I mean, you, if it starts off at 36,000 RPM, yeah. how long does that stay up for? Um, uh, we have a half-life of about 45 minutes. Right. So, yeah. Okay. Which, I mean, we, we tend to, most of our applications are trying to use, save it for, you know, two, three, five minutes at most. So it's, it's yeah. not a problem for us. We're not trying to be in the electric vehicle market on our own, i.e. drive into work in the morning and drive home again in the evening on a flywheel. Mm. Uh, you wouldn't get very far because our energy level is quite low, but that would then be a, f a factor against flywheels. But just for the braking at a bus stop or a traffic light, yeah, right. we have absolutely no issue with that. No, right. Actually, sorry to give you a longer answer, something I should have mentioned. It's seen as a great safety factor. You park an electric vehicle with an electric battery on it, and you can't service that vehicle without treating it as a high voltage system for months to come. It would be, you know, you're never quite sure that it's got rid of all its charge. Our system, we can more or less say, if, you know, come back after a two hour cup of tea and it's going to be dead. And therefore, there is no residual voltage. There's no high voltage risk. We can make sure if the system is stationary, it is safe to be worked on. Thank you. Hi, Robert Simpson, Dublin Institute of Technology. Um, the materials that are, it's made from, the composites, you know, have they been tested to their limit? in terms of their, their life capability? They're very well understood materials, yeah. yes. Yeah. Um, in what case, do you... Well, no, I was just wondering, did you are, are, are you, you have quite a large factor of safety there in the, in the calculations you showed. Yeah. You know, could you bring that back right down to what metals would be like? I think, I think we could get, I'm, I, yeah, I, I actually think we would get there eventually. We're, we're naturally a very safety and safety conscious mindset because we're putting this I'm putting this under seat of buses so you know absolutely duty of care there to be as safe as possible so we've done all the testing we we test these to destruction we test them for durability millions of cycles so we're confident in what we're producing as a, as a safe product it's the same materials used in the uh, aircraft industry uh, GKN aerospace down in uh, um, in Bristol and out, and out in America are building large sections of wings for for uh, passenger and military planes using this these materials so they're very well understood from that point of view so um, but we are dealing with phenomenally high forces and therefore you know I think it's it's natural for us to to err on the side of a good safety factor uh, so, you know, our safety case is that it, you know, we can't be going anywhere near that at the moment. Now, once we know an awful lot more, that's interesting. Would we, would we push the limit? Which would be great, because it would get us more energy stored in the same size machine. So, in, in the fact, yes, it would be good eventually to do that. I don't actually know at the moment whether we can control the motor above 38, 36,000 RPM, because there's a whole skill, a different issue there of, of effective motor control at those frequencies. So just, I suppose, another a secondary question, well, not, not related to that, but how is, the, how is the energy dissipated if it's not used? Is it just purely through conduction through the walls of the... Yeah. Of the yeah. Okay, so... Yeah, it's... Um, um, absolutely. The, the whole system is cooled. The, the flywheel itself is oil cooled because it goes around the stator, um, so you, you can dissipate heat out through the cooling system. If we need to slow a flywheel down for some reason, a fault or something, we can actually start running motor out of phase or we can we can do things to increase the inefficiency to to create heat and, and but you know actually yeah, that's the last thing we want to do I, I know that was one of my questions was that I noticed uh, that you had coolant mentioned mm -hmm. on one of your slides so yeah. it is oil cooled it is because that goes around the stage it's, it's enveloped in the oil yeah. so we have to use um, use that the power electronics and the motor are both water cooled so oh, okay. In the system on the bus, it all cools at the same temperature, which is yeah. good. So we, everything electrical likes to be about the same temperature, um, and so that is a cooling system. We have a oil to water, and then the water is cooled mm. through a normal radiator. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Shane. Hi, Shane Kevney. Sorry, really interesting talk. I just have one question. It's kind of, it's not on more um, flywheel to drive, but. 
Uh, is there potential for flywheels within, say, um, uh, control and power supply back to grids for mm. turbines? I don't know if I heard something about in California they're investing in flywheels for um, turbines into the, the grid, or do you know much about that? Or I, I know they do an awful lot of it. There are companies in America doing that. Um, there are versions of these kind of flywheels in much bigger... Uh, um, they're not restricted by the weight. I mean, the, the logic for us to be um, composite to be on a vehicle, of course, if you're going to be static and in a power station, you can be you know, much, much bigger and heavier without any problem. So would you need to pay for a composite solution? Probably not. So there are various systems. But yes, absolutely, flywheels are used very commonly for managing, and again, I'm not the expert, managing those peaks of expect you know, wind farms, particularly where the power is not constant. Okay. Is that is that a relatively new thing? So, because I don't I don't know, and like Irish wind farms, I don't know if I see it or that's all. That's the only reason I'm asking. I'm so that. tempted to say I don't think an Irish wind farm has a has a, a low uh, <laughs> low day, but yes, I uh, I'm not the expert on that, okay, but no. I do know they're about, but they're not our market because you know our, our systems are vehicle based. Yeah. I I know, like I remember actually when. Um, Jules is talking. I remember coming across a kind of a standby system for telephone exchanges years ago, and it was a flywheel, and it was about half a meter high, and it was magnetically bearing, you know, in yeah. a vacuum packed, and and it was just simply for telephone exchanges at the end of a long kind of cable run. So therefore, if the power went off, then the you no know, this flywheel took over and then generated the power for a short time mm -hmm. in order to power the exchange. That was, uh, that was a good few years ago, but when I mean, yes. you said half a metre high. Yes, I've seen those, and um, you know, there are applications of the, the composite ones that do static, you yeah. Know, yeah, as you say, much, yeah. much taller. Again, you can't go any wider. Yeah. That's absolutely set by the uh, stress level, but you can go as high as you like as long as your bearings will take it. Any other questions in the audience? Uh, okay. Sorry. It's okay, John. Yeah. Okay, John. Uh, I'll repeat. John, one thing Jules, I'm interested in is how mature is the application of this technology with buses? You know, the outside of a bus, it looks unchanged in many cases, beside the Boris buses. And is it, how many years have you been trialing in, in London bus? Uh, we've had a trial bus now. <laughs> Well, it's, it's fairly new to us. You can see from us, we bought the company a year ago. Yes. We're, we're ramping up. We're at the, as we'd say, the kind of pre-production phase. Uh, I think we've now done about 30-odd buses. Um, in uh, the first, the trial bus has been in London now for 18 months. And um, we've got buses in three other cities now. So we're, we're, we're growing as rapidly as we can with that, with that trial. And the availability of the buses is better or worse post the retrofit? In terms of, sorry, I'm not with you. The availability of the buses, the reliability, you know, the time that they require for uh, unforeseen maintenance, etc. Well, we, we, our system being a, you know, a, a mechanical system, is, is a very reliable process. So, because we're adding to a diesel engine, sure. then you know that as a it's a good starting point to be using the parallel system. If you're a series system where you are the full electric drive, any electrical gremlins and all these things probably have electrical gremlins, and we know our competitors did with with very many buses. Um, that that's a stopper, which is a bad thing. At least we have the benefit if our system has a has a problem it can be safely stopped and the bus carries on so effectively we we shouldn't change the the um, reliability of a bus so it's again a key a key factor at this stage because we are developing the technology so you know, things happen Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, I was just wondering, at 36,000 RPM, uh, what kind of bearings are you using? Um, they are, well, they look rel rel relatively normal. They're actually um, called ceramic hybrid bearings. They're, they're steel racers with ceramic ball 
bearings. And the oil filled then? To, no, it's Sorry? just it, It's just the heat dissipation that you're going to have building up in the circuit. And you talked earlier on about the cooling systems. Yeah, the, for cool, the cooling system goes down the core yeah. and cools the bearings from the inside. So the cooling, the bearings do have their own cooling loop. Okay. So, right, we, so we want as little heat getting into the rotor as possible, mm -hmm. because effectively that's spinning in a vacuum, and that we have no way of cooling it. Yeah. So um, the bearings are cool from the inside, but you know they're they're. Um, ceramic bearings that they're actually in the vacuum so they're running in a grease but a very special grease that can work in an absolute vacuum okay and i suppose all in all then by the time as the cooling fluids pumped around like what amount of efficiency loss do you have through heat and I suppose overall like what's your sort of efficiency profiles generally between mechanical losses like you have no drag because it's in vacuum but between bearings and About heat and then pumps 90, 93 percent 93 percent yeah so we, we can, I mean, one of the tests we do is we can put two flywheels next to each other. Mm -hmm. um, you know, one going idle speed, one going full speed, and then go like this. Change the, you know, push electric, and that's how we do durability testing, pushing them forward and backwards. And we can do that with a round trip of about a 90% efficiency. Okay. Right, thank you. Um, just one question. Uh, since I work in the education industry, um, what skills do you set the need for people in your company? Um, well, absolutely. I mean, there's a huge range of skills in our in our small team, and um, you can see the kind of vehicle mechanical um, integration skills um, are vi vi important to get the motor and the gearbox into the bus without affecting the bus um, running into noise problems or anything like that so that's that's a bunch of kind of more traditional vehicle skills and um, but also you know the the software that controls this is is fascinating so software skills um power electronics and um skills to as i say we can run a 600 volt motor with 120 kilowatts at 36,000 rpm takes a fair bit of clever power electronics um and the key thing about it is being able to do it all so efficiently, driving, driving efficiency all the time. So we've we've got that, and you know we've got a good bunch of motorsport engineers as well. So, okay. um, and obviously you stated at the start that it was a real combination between the kind of mechanical people and uh, kind of electrical people. Mm -hmm. um, so do you like? Uh, I presume that that's what your kind of main skill sets are: is that you have kind of bunch of mechanical people and a bunch of kind of electrical electronics people yeah and they're all integrated into separate teams yeah there's teams. there's no them and us anymore okay yeah i, uh, I had this argument with somebody in the uh, imec e professional review committee when he <laughs> accused somebody of being uh, unsuitable for the imec e because he worked on a computer <laughs> um yeah the, absolutely the skills you need now okay. um, to to be able to control mechanical things with algorithms with mm. you know that's where efficiency is going to come from and i was talking actually about the the control of a, a you know, humble wheel loader shovel mm. writing algorithms so the driver just needs to you know literally press forward and backwards mm. if you take that to where um you can see um komatsu are taking it they will become driverless vehicles mm. and that's a whole you know just operating in in a uh, and if you I believe the, uh, the lovely Komatsu video on the web that they've just been powered by a drone. But mm. why you need a drone for something that's not going very far, but mm. it looked good on the video. But that idea of autonomous control is mm. so much easier with an electric motor, but you have to have not only the control lab, but the safety systems, mm. the, the sensing systems to know what's going on around you. So okay. all those are fascinating. Okay. okay. Um, I think we'll finish at that. Thanks very much, Jules. I've got these bits if anybody wants to have a Okay. Um, we'll, uh, we'll let people come down and peruse them at the, um, just after we finish. Um, just to remind people, um, our next event is on the 30th of April. It's actually down in uh, Cork Institute of Technology, uh, where we'll have a lecture from the Medical Engineering Design and Innovation Centre, which is centred down in CIT, and that's thanks to Matt Cottrell. Uh, we also have a talk here in Engineers Ireland on the 5th of May, which is a Tuesday, half six, and that's on uh, research centres. Um, 
that's one of our, our areas that we wanted to address is kind of to broaden uh, the horizon for these research centres, at least the, like, uh, the perception of them, and to see what's available. Um, young members actually have an event on the 7th of May, which is kind of related to um, the automotive industry. It's how to get into the industry. And that's, you have to book in for that uh, via the Engineers Ireland site. Um, I'd like to thank Jules again for his uh, um, presentation. is really excellent. And I'd like to thank Rod for procuring Jules for us Bribe. this evening. <laughs> okay, um, thanks very much and uh, safe home. Yeah, thanks very much.